gives me a great, uh, great pleasure to introduce uh, Colin Angle, who's the founder and CEO of uh, iRobot, some, what, 22 years ago? So beating Apple to the use of the lowercase i, followed <laughs> by the uppercase letter by well, well over a decade. And um, I, I'm sure actually that, uh, as well as the questions I want to ask Colin, there's probably quite a few of you who would like to uh, ask uh, about, uh, about such an interesting industry and such interesting uh, developments in technology. So I'll do my very best to leave five minutes at the end for, uh, for, 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 for questions from, uh, for, from the audience. But anyway, Colin, let's start by, uh, th the thing that strikes me about robotics is it is an industry in which the ubiquity of robots has always seemed to be a tantalizing few years in the future. It's always just around the corner. And we're hearing a lot more about robots now, uh, not just in industry, we've seen them in, in factories for a long time, but in the homes, in combat zones, and so on and so forth. So is the future, is the future actually here now? Well, I think a future is here. The robot industry <coughs> is, has got to be one of the most disappointingly paced next great things that uh, have come along. I mean, since um, Rosie the Robot uh, taught us all what we wanted and, uh, in 1962, you know, decades upon decades have passed with, with very little uh, progress. And what actually has needed to happen is a reevaluation of what a robot is uh, in order to make progress. Because if robot means Android commander data from Star Trek, uh, we still actually have a number of decades to wait before that becomes practical and useful. But if we can get our mind around the fact that a, uh, a robot is a, a machine that connects perception with some type of artificial intelligence and action, then start building technology and businesses around that, we will finally start to see uh, the industry take off. And we're seeing the f first bits of that. Um, <coughs> how many of, of you in the audience uh, own a Roomba, just out of curiosity? Uh, hey, that's pretty good. I think it's six more than 24 hours six, ago Yeah, well. that's right, plus yeah. six. They, um, uh, we are seeing the first mainstreaming of a um, uh, of practical robotics going on uh, this year, last year. It, it, so that is, is very present. In, in Europe, um, this is a, a crazy uh, um, bit of data. In Europe, in Spain in particular, one out of three vacuum cleaners sold today is a robot. And what's special about Spain, well, they have a lousy economy and aren't necessarily um, possessed with the reputation of being the earliest tech adopters. So it's a wonderful thing to start to see uh, this type of technology having an impact. Um, throughout the rest of the world, it's, um, you know, it, it goes down substantially, but at least we have a foothold mm -hmm. in, the, uh, in the door of the, of the home today with... Uh, you know, our first practical robot, which means we're just about none of the way to where we'll end up, but it's, it's, it's a start. Okay, well, give us an idea of where we might end up in the home or wh what we might see over the, over the next few years. Okay, we've got vacuum cleaners. What else what w might we have to help us around the home? Well, the way... <coughs> I guess I, we think of it in a couple different ways. I've, I've got a star that I steer by, which I'll speak about in a second, um, as to where... I believe we in the robot industry need to go. Uh, tactically, if you, um, but that star is, is a little bit of, of the way off. Tactically, you, you, you look at things that people are doing in the home frequently uh, on one axis, and the desire to do that task is your vertical axis. So if you don't like to do it and you have to do it frequently, well, then you should have a robot doing it for you. And vacuuming is actually the, um, uh, <coughs> near number one, I think folding laundry would be rival vacuuming as far as things people don't like to do but have to do frequently. And unfortunately, um, manipulators that can effectively and um, fold your laundry at a low price is... So ironing, uh, ironing is something I'd really like, but, iron but, but, but that's clearly difficult. That, so that's, yeah. that's in the challenging side. Yeah, but, okay. um, you know, the, uh, we've, we've got um, 
great challenges with disease so that the vac yes. wet cleaning, disinfecting your yeah. floors, that's a good one. Uh, mowing lawns is a good one. <coughs> Actually, bringing things and, and, and picking up objects and tidying up your home is, is, is important because if you don't do that, then the rest of the cleaning is, is a major challenge. But that uh, requires arms and manipulators. That's a little bit further out as well. Okay. What about the idea that you might have a robot that could um, delegate tasks to other robots? Right. Well, the... Um, after a point, right, y yeah. if you have a Roomba in your home, okay, great, I've got a Roomba, I've programmed it, it comes out every day and vacuums my floor and I open it, empty it, you know, once a week. Great, now I get my second robot. Okay, now I'm dealing with two robots. Well, now I have a third robot. Well, now it's too much. I think that <coughs> the optimal number of robots that people should interact with is really about one to one and a half. Two is, is, is already getting a little complicated. And so one of the things that um, I think about as I imagine and start to build the robot-enabled home is how is it all going to work? Mm -hmm. Because Rosie from the Jetsons, well, there was one robot that did it all. Push to vacuum, you talk to Rosie. Well, that's not very practical because Rosie uh, did not abide by the laws of physics and thus it's a challenging product to make. So what you would really like to do is have point solutions, so small robots, a, ro a vacuum cleaning robot should be small so it can go under things, but there should be another robot that I talk to. The robot for me, the, um, the James Darling of, of Butler robots that uh, I can speak to, can navigate and understand my home, have a, a concept of what rooms are, where things are, what clean looks like, what dirty looks like, what um, friends and people who should be in the home look like and what people that don't look like and who are they. Um, that type of system that then delegates to the, all the other robots, perhaps even maintains the other robots or calls in service if there's an issue. And that head of household type system becomes the glue that ties technology together. It probably also extends and turns on your television, manages your, your home stereo, could even look in your refrigerator and, and uh, order food that you don't need. And the exciting thing is that this vision is not decades away. And there's an important reason for it. That's, uh, called the mobile industry. Uh, this is running through the robotics industry like a freight train. Uh, about seven or eight years ago, if you wanted to look at computer vision or speaker independent voice recognition or voice and video over IP or <coughs> man-machine interfaces, those were robot problems, roboticists and artificial intelligence guys. We're wrestling with this. And, <coughs> you know, until Roomba there and the manufacturing robots, there was really very, very little money <coughs> outside of academics going into solving these problems. So we muttered along very, very slowly toward one day we will have these capabilities. And then, of course, mm -hmm. the smartphone industry came by, blew by us, solved all these problems. In fact, here we're going like this. The mobile industry blows by us. And now the video gaming industry has blown by us and, and delivered the kinetic Xbox sensor, which is a gestural control interface uh, for gamers that uh, has already had more money put into development of gestural libraries than the history of 50 years of robotics. And suddenly, you can start envisioning and building a robot that can make maps, and avoid obstacles in your home. That's the robot part. And then have gestural voice, video, touchscreen interfaces. That's the rest of it. And in a matter of years or months, um, <coughs> we will start to take everyone who can program iPads and everyone who can program an Android um, and turn them into potential roboticists to write the apps to make 
the control over your home something that is uh, that delivers on the promise of Rosie. And presumably the other thing that the connection with the mobile industry brings is that this isn't just a robot for within the home, but of course it's connected to the outside world, and therefore there are remote activities that can that, that it can mm -hmm. undertake, which is uh, for so especially for people who find it difficult to look after themselves, a bit right. uh, older people, sick people, uh, maybe sick people who are a long way from the, from the, from the nearest doctor. Yeah. Well, we're I, we're I mentioned to shade into those now. Right, yeah. I mentioned the star that I steer yeah. by. I mean, and that is uh, <coughs> the fact that we need to extend our ability to live independently in our own homes much longer uh, than we we can do today. The the infrastructure to uh, support people living in assisted living is in the decline. I think the average age of, of uh, the nursing population is well over 50 years. The cost of assisted living is $10,000 a month. That's a mortgage on a $2 million home, so that's not sustainable. And people don't want to move out of their home in general. Three quarters of, of, of elders don't want to move. And so that if we're going to avoid a, a financial crisis, a cultural crisis, we need to create the technological tools that allow people mm -hmm. to get the services that the old model of centralizing <coughs> the elders and bringing care to them uh, was human capital efficient, but physical capital incredibly inefficient. Um, so that doesn't work. But if we can turn that inside out through the use of connectivity, the network, and uh, these robots that I'm describing, then you can stay home and have the expertise come to you. And I think that's what you were getting at. Yeah. Um, we can run FaceTime or Google Talk on these things. Well, if this is the head of a robot and I'm a doctor with appropriate security, I can log into your robot, I can cr do a virtual house call or a nurse or a loved one can do a virtual visit and instead of forcing you to the go to the hospital, ensure that you're on the right medicinal regime, ensure that your uh, symptoms are under control, and give you and your loved ones the peace of mind that you are being cared for without centralizing you into a, um, a facility. And what application might that have? Because um, so far I think we've been talking uh, about you know, maybe countries like this one or, or, or Western Europe or, or Japan. Mm -hmm. What sort of application might this have in uh, places where you know, the medical infrastructure isn't, isn't, isn't terribly good to, mm -hmm. to begin with, where you, there, there is a shortage of doctors and nurses and so forth? Well, some of this is going on right now. Uh, there's a, a company in Santa Barbara called InTouch Health who has created some robots that actually allow doctors to diagnose patients in a hospital setting remotely. So if you travel to Bermuda, and you end up in their hospital, <coughs> you're going to get diagnosed by a doctor at the Leahy Clinic in Massachusetts. They, uh, and there's a similar partnership with the hospital, um, <coughs> uh, forgetting the name, in, in Africa. And uh, the idea that we can take specialists and then geographically uh, leverage them through remote presence technology mm -hmm. uh, is very, very powerful. And so even if you could, uh, if, if you have a community, an underserved community in the United States or anywhere else in the world, as long as you have decent connectivity, yeah. you can start to beam in expertise on an as needed basis. And I think this is gonna be a, uh, a very exciting, important mm -hmm. dimension. That'll actually probably develop first because the dollars involved of leveraging a doctor's time will support the technology before we see these um, uh, whole human interface robots um, down at price points that can go effectively into, into homes. Mm, okay, and I, I guess it, it doesn't, obviously it doesn't substitute for everything because if you're, say, in the hospital in Africa and the doctor says, well, I diagnose that you have disease X and you need drug Y, you still need to get drug Y to, to, to those people, but it saves on the, um, the, the, uh, the, you know, the doctor's expertise and the doctor's time so the doctor can serve more people at once. I agree, mm -hmm. but I think that if you know that person X needs treatment Y, 
then at least there is a concrete, actionable, uh, supportable thing that perhaps the West could take some responsibility to deliver. Okay, that would be an interesting thing to see. Okay, and w one other area I think is, it, it seems to be a sort of common theme with uh, robots in the outdoors, if okay. you like, is that they are good at getting to places where people can't, or they're good at making it easier for people in places that are very dangerous and very remote. So there seems to be a, 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 a common thread, if you like, through uh, disaster zones or war zones, uh, whether they're helping the armed forces or whether they're mm -hmm. helping, uh, presumably helping, uh, helping NGOs too, as well as Royal Anning. Uh, and in, uh, even underwater, I think. So there right. seems to be a sort of a common thread of putting robots where it's not too easy for humans to be. I mean, it, there has to be a value, an economic value for robots, and one of the things robots can do very well is travel to <coughs> dirty or dangerous or difficult to get to places and, and perform work. And then depending on what you're trying to do, um, there may be a business there. Uh, we've got uh, <coughs> over 4,500 robots in Iraq and Afghanistan uh, diffusing, uh, diffusing bombs and dealing with roadside bombs. And so that is a, um, uh, an activity where it's been a, um, an okay business for us, but more importantly, uh, thousands of lives uh, have been saved through having robots do tasks that um, really uh, it's nearly inhumane to be asking uh, <laughs> soldiers <laughs> to go and try to clean up these messes. Um, but we've also uh, had, <coughs> unfortunately, the opportunity to go um, and participate in two of the uh, most highly publicized environmental disasters over the past couple of years. And, and not a good business, but a wonderful thing, something we're incredibly proud to have been able to do. Uh, the first one being the Gulf of Mexico, where the Deep Horizon uh, offshore drilling platform uh, exploded. <coughs> Millions of gallons of oil were pumped into the, into the Gulf. Uh, there was significant effort to go clean up the oil on the surface of the water. Yeah but some scientists were hypothesized that there were pools of oil forming underneath the water because of some of the chemicals were used and because of the nature of, of the leak. And <coughs> we discovered, actually, uh, we got a phone call from uh, one of the scientists who, were, um, who understands the sensor package that we put on the robot and said, you know, if you configure the, the sensor slightly differently, we could use your sea glider to go search for these plumes of oil. And so we said, okay, we'll do that. And made the modifications, put, the, uh, put one of our sea gliders, normally is used for demonstration, onto a back of a pickup truck, drove down to Louisiana, rented a boat, put it in the water, and <coughs> found these underwater plumes of oil. And made that data public. We basically, we, we, uh, every time the, the robot surfaced, we just beamed our data onto the public internet and and a cadre of, of scientists analyzed the data and used that to show where the plumes of oil were, or at least verified the existence of these plumes. And then sending robots to the Fukushima reactor uh, in Japan was another um, uh, <coughs> uh, opportunity for robots to show that they really can go out and make a difference. And we were able to go uh, allow the uh, rescue workers to pull back, characterize the, um, use the robots to characterize the environmental conditions inside the reactors, and they're, they're being used every single day. Um, they've gone past characterization, and now they're being used to um, clean up the robots. It's in a, in a strange twist of, of, of the world. The, we have a 450-pound robot that, um, <coughs> can climb stairs and lift you up, and they've configured it with a giant industrial vacuum cleaner. So it's, it's, there's, there's a, a, a truck outside the, the reactor with a huge hose leading to the robot that's out there vacuuming up all the radioactive debris inside. The inside. So um, can't get away from vacuuming, no matter, no matter <laughs> how hard I try. But, uh, yeah, it's your biggest vacuum cleaner yet. Uh, okay, th th Another area which I think is um, 
of interest to people, especially um, now that robots are being used increasingly in combat zones, mm -hmm. uh, either as helpers, but also increasingly as, 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 uh, as, as, as drones, actually, as, uh, as, as, as weapons, and are b killing people in larger numbers, simply because there's, there, there, there's, there's more of them. Um, now, the interesting question this, this raises is, is uh, how much autonomy can you give to, to robots when they're in a position to uh, harm people? So I'm not, th this isn't the sort of uh, uh, science fiction horror show view, view of the robot as the robot being uh, capable of turning on, its, uh, turning on its masters or running amok. This is the decision for humans as to how much autonomy they should give to a robot which might or might not be able, which might be able to inflict harm on somebody. When do you inflict harm? What are the rules? And even outside combat zones, suppose we have, uh, the, within a few years, suppose we have a lot of driverless cars, mm -hmm. and these cars may be a lot safer than humans most of the time, but there will be occasions when uh, it, it is inevitable that a car, uh, a driverless car is going to crash, that it's going to do some damage. Are there ways of making decisions so that it can do as little damage as possible or damage one thing rather than another? What sort of, uh, how, how, do we, how do we deal with these ethical questions? <coughs> not, not a three minute uh, I'm sorry, a, a yeah. question to, to, <laughs> to, to lay down at the end, yeah. but I mean, uh, the first question on the military is, is, is yeah. has a very simple answer. Yeah. A robot should not be making dis life or death decisions. It has no ability, and nor will it any time soon have the ability to decide friend or foe what the situation is. There should and is a human in the loop. Uh, our robots are, um, uh, don't uh, are not in the world um, of weaponization, but there are some drones that we... we, we uh, read about that certainly do carry lethal weapons. There is strict, strongly adhered to doctrine that there needs to be a man in the loop. Yeah. Um, and the man will never come out of the loop. Man will not come out of the loop, probably not in my lifetime. Uh, it just doesn't make sense. Now, there is a question about, um, you know, this is, if, if I want to go and, and, and get a, a visceral reaction, we, we talk, uh, you can talk about this stuff. <laughs> But it's, it's interesting. There is the academic discussion, and then there's the practical discussion. I had a, um, was privileged to go uh, serve on a panel at the NDIA. This is the National Industry of Defense, uh, National Industry of Defense Association that uh, focuses on um, giving the military a voice back to industry. And there, there, was, a, there was a group of sergeants straight back from, um, I think it was Afghanistan, talking about their impression of robots. And it was a, a remarkable discussion around um, friendly fire and what happens mm -hmm. when the first robot with a weapon uh, goes and, and does something um, unplanned or, 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 or tragic. And the academic view was, well, that would be the end of, of the robot industry. And the sergeants were saying, this happens every day without robots. Give me a tool that allows me to shoot second and survive. Give me a tool that instead of me jumping through the door, potentially getting shot, throwing a grenade in the door, potentially killing innocents, allows me to do something else, throw the robot in and see if anyone shoots at it instead. And so there's a, uh, sometimes we get wrapped up in trying to be perfect and we should try to be perfect. But what's going on today is still horrific. And, and so I think that uh, there needs to be a good discussion about what is the right balance. And if we're ever going to see robot cars on the highway in any non-academic fashion, we're going to have to wrestle with the fact that no robot-driven car will ever be perfect. Even if a robot-driven car was perfect, it would still get into accidents because humans are imperfect. And even if 
the person was at fault, he would not feel that he was at fault. He would blame the car. And so that what is good enough? And, and I think that's an, a, a challenge that um, we have to look to um, society to answer. Do we want cars or not? If we want them, then we're going to have to find a way to limit the liability on the manufacturer of those cars. Um, certainly worked when the automo automobile first came in. I mean, automobiles are, even today, are horribly dangerous things to operate. But they are so useful that we accept them in our world, despite the fact that they're imperfect. So if a robot car ever, I think what it needs to do is demonstrate that it has a utility that is so compelling that society needs it to exist, and then we'll be forced to wrestle to a positive conclusion as to limiting liability. Uh, otherwise, they're going to be uh, fun toys for, for academics for decades to come. Okay, it's th we've got a couple of minutes left, so if anybody would like to ask uh, a question of their own, that would be more than welcome. Yeah, Hi there. Hey, uh, uh, the remote presence thing, I, I can see that on the high end of the labor scale like doctors. Mm -hmm. Is there any work being done on the low end of the labor? I mean, if you want to have somebody fold your laundry, could a remotely operated... Um, uh, remote presence robot be being operated by somebody in lower cost labor areas to fold your laundry for you. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I think that artificial intelligence is good, but it is a long way from being able to do common, everyday, commonsensical things. And so that if you want robots to perform those things, it is a very viable strategy to rent a brain. Right? So to go and say, all right, forget trying to go recreate the human brain. We have lots of them. And there's a giant population uh, in our own country of people who would love to be working um, if only they could find the right opportunity and, and have skills to do things quite well. So I think that there's a, a fantastic opportunity. This needed to happen. Connectivity needed to happen. And then the robot platforms themselves need to continue to move down in the price point to, to a, a situation where they can um, provide a cost-effective body for that rented brain to do something that is value-creating. But I see that as absolutely in our future. And, um, you know, it was an idea that got me interested in remote present robots back about um, <coughs> 12 years ago when uh, I was sitting around with a colleague saying, you know, how are we going to make this industry really take off? I mean, if we could build a robot with true human intelligence and capabilities, that ought to do it, because if, if, if not, then what would? And you follow that logic through, then you say, okay, well, let's try. And you start knocking down the problems, and you get to the human brain part. And um, for a very modest cost, you can now bring that to the table as, as an asset. Great. Can we uh, just I about... Uh, I think we're done. Are we, are we done? I think we're just about out of time, which is, <laughs> which is a pity. <laughs> That's Mark's coming over here. I, 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 I could have kept going for a while. I'm but, actually uh, coming over here for a different reason. All right. Thank you, Patrick. Pleasure, mm -hmm. Mark. Con. Yesterday, we gave an award for the CEO of the year. We don't do this either every year but we occasionally do it, and I'd like to give you an award this morning uh, as Entrepreneur of the Year. Thank you. We, we think of you as one of us at FIRE. This is your second time here. And, and watching you grow and watching your company grow and all the efforts you've made to uh, bring robots into utility situations, not dream situations, uh, is inspiring to all of us. And I think you're a world leader in this, and I know it ain't easy, and, and you inspire us with your great work. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's uh, been a journey. <laughs>